The anime started with a story about a hero who, like others, destroys all that causes sorrow in order to heal the pain of those in need of salvation. Every hero, however, prepares for a premature death whether through treachery by someone he trusted or by stumbling into an enemy's trap. Once, one of these heroes was so powerful that people avoided him out of dread. Yet, he continued to help those in need at the expense of his own heart. When the planet was on the verge of extinction, he pleaded to the gods for a desire in his next incarnation. Next, a teen named Alan wakes up to his brother yelling his name because their father has called. This sibling despises Alan for being lazy and undeserving of his comfort and wishes their father would be tougher with the older brother's actions. However, Alan believes that today is the day everything will change. So, Alan enters the throne room where his father informs him that the boy was born into the Westfeld Ducal family 15 years ago but has never gone beyond level 1. Worst of all, Alan did not get a gift from the gods at the previous day's blessing ritual, despite the fact that every child in this world does. As a result, Alan's father regards him as a failure who brings shame to the family name, despite being the Westfelt family's heir and kicks him out of the house. Outside the gates, Alan rejoices in his freedom from such an awful duke. After being reincarnated, he could now pursue his own path and find the inner serenity he craved in his previous life. For this, the youngster journeys to the borderlands in the east of Westfeld where he expects to live a quiet life free of turmoil, as opposed to his previous existence, where everyone feared him. On his route to his objectives, he finds a good area to rest before continuing his track, but in the distance he notices a knight named Beatrice who is alone against some stone dogs. She rips the animals apart but they soon regenerate putting her companion Reese in risk. Beatrice encourages her friend to go but Reese refuses to leave the knight alone with these animals. As Alan watches the scene, he recognizes the first princess of Adestella's kingdom and wonders what a princess would be doing there. Then we're brought to a memory in which Reese overhears visitors at a ceremony insulting Alan, the heir to the ducal house of Adestella, calling him a coward and Craig is undoubtedly sad after losing his wife and being left with this failing son. Reese rages against the men, claiming that Alan is a very decent youngster. Faced with this recollection, the youngster believes he can protect the girl who saved him. Beatrice receives a strong hit and falls to the ground leaving the princess helpless. Alan races toward the danger, where Reese has already embraced death and it seems remarkable that all she can think of at that point is Alan. As a result, she shouts out the boy's name before being attacked by the hounds, while the boy saves the princess in time, asking her whether anyone called his name. Reese wants to know how Alan ended up there at that time, but the youngster is too preoccupied with coping with the other animals who remain a menace. He charges against them using his divine sight to identify his adversary's weak areas. Focusing on this, Alan uses the end of the world and blossoming of 100 flowers abilities to launch many swords at the targets. The threat had been eliminated but Beatrice's life remained in risk. Alan recognizes Beatrice from ancient times and offers to treat her wounds. He employs a procedure that entirely heals the warrior's wounds, even restoring her armor. Faced with so much power Reese questions how her friend got to this point and he tries to hide the reality that he received it from a previous life. Beatrice believes it is a gift from another level that the church is unaware of. The princess accepts this concept which the lad affirms, he wonders why the princess is at this location and she responds that she got a spiritual revelation a few days earlier. It wasn't specific information but the princess's gift stated that if she paid attention to the words uttered, she may avoid something horrible happening. Through this revelation, the two were led to Column Village on the border but they were ambushed along the route. Beatrice claims that if it hadn't been for Alan the two would have died. The princess also wants to know what Alan is doing there, but our boy prefers to converse in a carriage just behind them. Reese remarks that it is broken but Alan repairs the vehicle with more healing light magic. Inside the carriage, Alan claims to have been exiled from the Westfell family and plans to travel to the domain's borders. He inquires whether the princess authorizes it, stating that a servant with his abilities would be quite beneficial for training. Beatrice remarks that he would certainly need to be returned given the crown's interests, but Princess Reese decides to prioritize her buddy before the kingdom, even if it renders her unsuited for royalty. As night sets, the three arrive in the village which is unusually empty and quiet, Alan doesn't even notice the presence of monsters around. Reese points out that the team was not attacked after Alan joined, and the boy believes it is because the monsters terrified of something and avoid the village. However, a little farther forward they discovered the locals assembled in front of a structure from which a man had expelled a girl. Reese identifies her as the light brought to her as a sign and her name is Akira. 
On the other hand, Akira has no idea who the girl speaking to her is, so the princess introduces herself, upset that she has not been recognized after seeing the girl, the entire palace and even having lunch with her. Alan wants to know what this like discourse is about, so Beatrice explains that it comes from a gift called Valiant, which is so rare that it is only granted to one person in each generation and bestows the power of 1,000 soldiers on the bearer. In this generation, the heroine with the most powerful gift is Akira and Risa's discovery was to become a guide to the light and destroy the darkness. Soon the party gathers to satisfy their hunger, and Akira confesses that she had been roaming aimlessly until she came across this settlement. When a youngster informed her that she had nearly been sacrificed to the dragon that lives in the neighboring mountains, Akira sought information from the village leader, but he advised her not to intervene. When confronted with this, Alan speculates that they let the dragon to stay for safety, as monster attacks are a matter of life or death in a small village like this, explaining the region's unusual lack of monsters. Akira agrees with the idea and quickly discloses that she told the girl who was offered as a sacrifice to hide in a nearby cave until everything was sorted. However, finding nothing remarkable in this location, Akira decides to destroy the dragon once and for all, and invites all who choose to join her. Alan contemplates the idea that the villagers might not want to get rid of the dragon, and that killing it could lead to a battle, but Akira promised to aid the child, and she intends to do so. After Akira leaves, Reese and Beatrice decide to accompany her and Alan finally follows suit since he does not want to enjoy peace and calm on the frontier while his friends are in danger. Akira meets the gang near the mountain where the dragon lives to plan his strategy. She will approach the peak from the main road, while the others will circle around from behind to surround the beast. Alan wonders if it wouldn't be better for him to go in front of Akira but she declines, believing that he can manage things on his own. Alan downplays it, claiming that he is being overstated but Akira believes that the boy is not an average person. Finally, Akira explains that she intends to fight with Alan but only after destroying the dragon. She then proceeds ahead following her method and urges the rest of the crowd to hurry with everyone informed of their duties. The trio climbs the mountain slopes and Alan is concerned about the princess, but she assures him she knows a thing or two about self-defense. Meanwhile, Beatrice wonders why the Westfeld who pride themselves on their military power haven't located a dragon within their boundaries. In turn, Alan feels that his former family and this dragon have some sort of relationship, hence there has been no strikes between them. He speculates that perhaps the community was created specifically for the purpose of giving sacrifices. With this, Beatrice agrees that keeping an agreement with the dragon would keep the border secure, but Alan believes that is merely a byproduct of this connection and that the true goal is far worse. At this point, the dragon detects Akira's presence and attacks, she retaliates by invoking the Sovereign of Lightning. Believing that this will solve the problem, but the dragon emerges unhurt, mocking the human and questioning whether this is a joke. In response to the hubris, Akira decides not to back down in this conflict, but the dragon warns that innocent people may become victims of the crossfire. Akira then notices the tiny girl who had been presented as a sacrifice. Akira inquires as to how the dragon discovered this youngster to which it says that it led her to escape on purpose because its objective was never to devour humans, but rather to enjoy watching the sorrow on their faces. A dragon's life is too lengthy to waste on such exciting pursuits, so it released the offering to see what happened next. Faced with this insolence, Akira becomes enraged and attacks the dragon with a final stroke of celestial blue lightning devastation, she believes she has defeated the opponent. Nevertheless, as she turns around, the monster remains uninjured. Mocking the heroine's vulnerability, the dragon slaps the girl hard, remarking that it is absurd for someone so useless to call oneself a hero immobilized. Akira sees there is a gap in power between them as the dragon fills its mouth with fire. As it was about to deliver the ultimate blow, Alan appeared and tore off one of its wings. Alan stands in front of Akira to protect her and taunts the dragon, mentioning its hubris thus far, causing the creature to approach aggressively at the humans. Alan asks Reese to look after the heroine while Beatrice takes the infant. Then he uses assassin sword, dealing massive damage to the adversary. The beast marvels how a normal person with the blonde sword can wound it since it is the red dragon king, the closest living being to a god. Alan agrees that this monster is on a different level, but after observing the battle between him and Akira, he believes he can win using his end of the world technique. However, the dragon acts dirty using the rest of the party as defenseless shields. However, Reese inspires Alan to do what needs to be done and he recalls how he lost the ability to face people after being labeled a failure. Still, he sees that Reese has instilled a peculiar fearlessness in him. 
so he charges at the dragon who decides to kill everyone at once. But the warrior uses the end of the world's supreme ability and when the weapon's strong brightness pierces the creature's body, the blackness of the sky dissolves and the red dragon king scales fall from the sky. Shortly after, Akira awakens and embraces the kid she pledged to save, while Alan realizes that saving a princess and assisting a hero in killing a dragon is not the kind of tranquil existence he seeks. However, when Reese extends her hand to the child, he sees that a minor deviation on the journey isn't detrimental. The story continues, we see Alan wakes up the next day shocked and apologizing for sleeping too long, but Reese reassures him. After all, the battle with the Red Dragon King must have been extremely taxing. So Alan asks where the others are, and the princess gestures to the middle of the field, where Akira and Beatrice are engaged in a training duel. Then Reese uses the opportunity to describe her ability to heal people, which she exhibited before. However, Alan recounts hearing stories about a miracle saint who heals any illness or injury at the doorsteps of needy families and expresses surprise that the princess, whether she's a princess or a wonderful saint remains just herself. With that said, an atmosphere of attachment develops between the two, but Akira calls for Alan to train with them, breaking up the intimate moment. The adventurers subsequently bid farewell to Akira and the little rescue girl whom they offered to accompany them on their journey, but she dislikes carriages and prefers to walk instead. Reese asks if Akira is certain she wants to stay with the child, but she says they've already bonded and her family no longer exists, so returning her to the same town isn't a smart idea. The small girl is overjoyed at the prospect of starting a new life, while Akira apologizes to Alan for the shattered sword, saying that she should have killed the dragon rather than leaving everything to the kid. As a result, Akira feels inadequate and plans to hand over the mighty sword to someone deserving of it, in this case Alan. Alan says that he could only win with the Akira's assistance and that to the small child by her side. Akira is the only hero who matters around there. Thus, the two say their goodbyes and part ways. In the late afternoon, Alan's father informs a strange man in a suit that the Red Dragon King was destroyed while attempting to draw the heroine into an ambush. The man concludes she received the saint's assistance, and the duke understands there's more to it. Alan's younger brother is enraged by the dragon's death, regretting that the clay dogs were unable to destroy the princess and promises to send a whole pack next time to avoid failure. However, the duke reminds them that the dragon's demise limited the amount of material available, therefore they cannot waste magical life forms. The guy believes that being thrifty will allow the princess to escape, but the duke tells him that as long as the targets are in Westfelt territories, there will be plenty of opportunity to catch her. More significantly, the duke wants to know if the elf has been found, to which the mysterious man says that there is no need to hurry because he will soon give the elf's head to the noble. With the man and the suit's departure, the duke rejoices at the opportunity to bury these irritating gods' puppets and exact revenge on the Westfeld family. Elsewhere, in the carriage Alan inquires about Reese's acquaintance a blacksmith, and she tells that this blacksmith lives in Granholm, a city near theirs. Reese wishes she could ask her friend to manufacture a new sword for Alan. He, in turn, startled to learn about border cities, while Beatrice insists that their acquaintance is a skilled blacksmith, despite the fact that there aren't many else. Reese then apologizes to Alan for putting him in this situation and offers to give him the sword as a reward. Alan appreciates the gift but questions if the princess should return to the capital. She reveals that in addition to being with Beatrice, she had previously notified her father. As night arrives, the company makes camp to sleep and Beatrice offers to start a fire, but Alan uses his magic to produce fire for everyone, leaving the warriors startled. Reese is fatigued and falls asleep on her Alan's shoulder which Beatrice taunts about, claiming it's fine because they're engaged, but Reese makes it obvious that they are no longer engaged and she does not want to sleep on the boy's lap. Despite her remarks, she falls asleep on Alan's shoulder and he realizes that this is his first moment of peace since being in this planet. He recalls that his first meeting with Reese was likewise on a gorgeous moonless night. On that night, she spotted Alan on a balcony and introduced herself, sparking a chat about the beauty of the night. Furthermore, she reveals that she is counting on the lad from now on because they are engaged, which confuses Alan. The next morning they arrive in Grand Home, which Alan describes as being so active that it does not appear to be a border town. Beatrice notes that visitors and wanderers frequently pass through this type of city because it is on the border. They all arrive at the blacksmith's house, but it appears that the elf is not there. Alan discovers that the entrance is unlocked, 
so the girls enter and shout out for their friend Noel, while Alan admires the fine craftsmanship of the weaponry inside. Reese screams as she sees Noel unconscious on the floor, but Beatrice tells her that it is merely the elf's typical deep sleep. With that, the saint heals her companion and the bodyguard reveals that Noel doesn't eat drink or sleep when she's crafting a weapon, so she drops out from weariness. The princess has already asked her to take it easy at work but she never does. At that point, the blacksmith wakes up and finds her pals, whom she hasn't seen in a long time, but she wants to know who the guy next to them is. So he's introduced as Alan, one of Reese's guards and he requests the elf to manufacture a sword for him. However, Noelle has too many orders lined up, so she does not have time for that. Reese is frustrated and Beatrice understands the blacksmith's point of view, in which he complains because this man already has a sword. Alan demonstrates that the weapon is broken and the elf feels ashamed that someone so clumsy wants to handle a weapon she designed. However, as she picks up the sword, she finds that it was pushed to its limits to break like way which intrigues the blacksmith to the point that she changes her mind and agrees to produce another blade. She asks if Alan wants a sword that outperforms the sacred sword or simply the most powerful weapon she can create. After all, only a few people are capable of using such equipment, and Noelle feels Alan is one of them. With that said, the boy has no reason to reject, so Noelle prepares to begin the task by shoving all of the visitors out. Alone inside the home, the elf recalls Vanessa, a blacksmith she dearly liked as a youngster, and quickly swears to create a weapon that will outperform the sacred sword. As she goes, Reese hopes Noelle does not overwork herself, and Alan proposes that the party locate an inn to stay in while they wait for the sword to be finished. Nearby, a woman reveals herself and vows to report what she sees. She soon tells the man in the suit that the saint was seen with her bodyguard and another warrior, which surprises him because he expected the princess to be accompanied only by Beatrice, so he intends to investigate the situation. Meanwhile, in a nearby inn, Alan inquires about what they want to do during these days and Beatrice suggests that he do what he has always desired relax and not worry. However, Reese proposes that he go to the Adventurer's Guild and sell the stuff that the dragon dropped, which Alan believes is an excellent plan to defray the hotel bills. With that agreed, the girls decide to take a walk around the city in Alan's absence. With the youngster gone, Beatrice wonders if the two of them can really handle this situation, but Reese chooses not to involve Alan. Shortly after, Alan finds the guild and displays the dragon scales he looted, and the receptionist is thrilled to see such a rare treasure on the counter. Unsure what to do, she takes the summons and hurries to talk with the manager leaving Alan empty-handed. The man in the suit takes advantage of the circumstance and approaches Alan, asking for information about the dragon scales the youngster is carrying. Seeing his lack of decorum, the man removes his hat and properly introduces himself as Horus, along with his friend Mylene, a rare Amazon found in these areas. Horus explains that he never gets tired of hearing explorer stories, and he wants to know if Alan earned these dragon scales on his own. In turn, our boy reveals that he had the heroine's assistance and Horus is interested by this exchange. However, the attendant returns at that point, claiming to have determined the value of the scales. Alan looks back at the mysterious man, but he has vanished along with his partner. Outside, Horace tells Mylene that he never anticipated the man escorting the princess would be such a useless person with no talent. However, the Amazon has a strong dislike for that young man, despite Horace's belief that he is not a problem. Days later the trio returns to Noelle's blacksmith expecting that the sword is finished, but she passed out again on the ground after being healed, Noelle gestures to the most powerful weapon she can create. Alan is confident that the sword he is wielding is magnificent. Noelle wants to test the weapon right away, but Reese tells her that she will not always be mending the elf. Nonetheless, the blacksmith chooses to follow Alan since only by inspecting the sword can she determine whether any adjustments are required. Alan notes the girl's perfectionism and wonders why she chose to be a blacksmith. She wonders if it's unusual for an elf to work in this field, and Alan feels it's due to the race's unique talent, that is why dwarves are generally better suited to it. Noelle admits that she was raised by a dwarf and has no idea where she was born or who her parents are. All she recalls is being in an unfamiliar location, wandering aimlessly until she was saved by Vanessa. Vanessa was persistent, clumsy, and belligerent. She never wanted to teach Noelle how to create a sword, yet she remained an essential master to the elf. Instead of concluding the story Noelle decides, it doesn't matter and flees to avoid exposing herself so personally. 
So Horace takes advantage of the opportunity to appear again, saying that he would like to hear more stories like that. When they return to the city, Alan detects something weird about this man and this Amazon girl, but before they can talk, Noelle rushes the youngster to finish the sword test. The elf studies Horace and believes he is someone she knows, but she soon abandons the notion. As they walk away, the man in the suit tells Mylene that the youngster probably didn't intrude on their affairs, so he begs the Amazon to keep a watch on Alan so he doesn't discover the secret. Returning to the warrior, he tries the sacred sword and after fighting some animals, he is pleased with the blade, so Noelle steals the weapon and demonstrates her skill, which is the capacity to discern conditions that are unseen to regular eyes in this type of weapon. Analyzing Alan's angle, speed, and precise posture with the sword, she is confident that her picture of him as the ideal user of the sacred sword was true. Still, she is curious to know how the youngster fared against the tougher monster, so she asks him to continue on the route head deeper into the woodland. They arrive at a location where Noel claims there have always been numerous monsters, but it is vacant so she assumes they are scared of Alan's presence. However, the youngster is certain that the terror is not of him but of something else nearby, he casts a spell to clear the fog, showing a massive wolf that frightens Noelle, reminding her that this thing swallowed Vanessa. When confronted with this, she stammers in terror before asking Alan to use the sacred sword to end the savage beast. The story continues, we see Noelle's past where she attempts to catch Vanessa's attention but Vanessa is very focused on her profession. The elf says she is hungry which irritates Vanessa, who frowns in an attempt to distract the tiny one. However, hours passed and the blacksmith was still working, while Noelle had managed to find something to eat. The elf approaches Vanessa and wonders how she manages to utilize so many different tools but Vanessa keeps silent, irritated by being ignored. Noelle misbehaves, lifting a massive sword with her hands before losing balance and falling, knocking over several items. Even still, Noelle has not received the attention she desired so she chooses to back off and sit near the dwarf again. Noelle wonders what's so amazing about hammering on a sword all day, especially when it results in feeling ill from not eating or drinking for days. When Noelle realizes she won't achieve what she wants from a distance, she approaches Vanessa, constantly calling her dumb for not understanding how to talk but even this strategy fails. The next day, Noelle sleeps wherever in the home as the hammering continues unabated until Vanessa stops her work. Proud of the sword she created, Vanessa lifts it with a smile as Noelle observes with interest. After that, we return to the present situation where Noelle insists on Alan killing the beast, but he argues he has no reason to because the wolf is simply sleeping in a corner away from humans. He refuses to take on the elf's vengeance, so Noelle takes the blade and seeks revenge for herself. However, Alan warns her against it, noting that the creature Fenri possesses a barrier that negates any assault below a particular level. This sword for example, would not even scratch the monster, and he tells Noel that she understands this because she has yet to build a weapon stronger than the sacred sword, Alan leaves the decision to the elf. He returns to the hotel and notifies the rest of the group about the big beast in the border zone. He believes someone brought the Fenri to this land since it was hidden by magic and Alan has a theory about why. Before that, he asks if Reese and Beatrice have revealed their genuine objective and the girls understand they can't keep anything from him. Reese reveals that roughly three months ago, the famed General Cyril, one of the kingdom's most powerful was slain, nobody knows why but the murderer carried the general's head with him. Many spells were cast to try to discover the motive but it remains unknown to this day. The culprit is suspected to be a demon, as these beings use magic that humans do not understand, however because demons aren't known for killing humans or worrying about politics, it's possible that he's acting on directions from someone else. For all of these reasons, Reese and Beatrice were studying this case in this city, and after some consideration, Alan believes he has a suspect. Meanwhile, near the border, Mylene wonders who was able to undo the Fenris camouflage, as it is not easy to do. As a result, she believes she is dealing with a more serious enemy than Horace realizes. She returns to her supervisor to report on her task. He tells her that he will make his move soon because his time in this city is up. Thus, Mylene must bring the elf and the saint's skulls. When Horace notices the girl appears terrified by the request, he wonders how a feared Amazon could be so sensitive. A magical servitude collar appears on the girl, and the man makes it obvious that he will not take no for a response. Meanwhile, Noel is creating new weapons and recalls Alan's comment that depending on how his blade is improved, it may one day be able to harm a Fenry. Noel wants him to tell her everything he knows about it, and Alan cautions the elf not to be careless with what he's going to teach her. 
Persistent in her objectives, Noelle is confident that one day she would be able to overcome the sacred sword, but her tiredness has caused her to fall asleep again. Then Noelle has a nightmare about the Fenrir attacking her home, and she becomes trapped beneath the debris that fell from the ceiling. Vanessa attempts to combat the Fenrir and Horace confesses she is a superb blacksmith, which is a problem for him because he does not want anyone to be able to create weapons superior to the sacred sword. Vanessa advances toward the wolf at this point, but his magical shield shatters her blade leaving her vulnerable to the creature. After dealing with Vanessa, the Fenrir charges for the elf, but Akira appear and fires a lightning bolt at it. This spell has little impact on him, so the heroine advances and slices him with her sword, causing Horus to flee alongside the beast. With the attackers fleeing, Noelle visits her master's body to grieve her loss. Akira tries to persuade her to treat to her wounds, but Noelle wonders why the heroine possessed a sword capable of harming the wolf while Vanessa did not. Soon, the young elf clutches the weapon that her master took so long to create and sobs in front of her body. At dawn, Noelle awakens feeling abnormally light and hearing a disturbance outside, she believes it's Reese but Alan is checking to see if the blacksmith isn't overdoing it. As promised, after a long day of work, the blacksmith completes another blade and returns to the woodland where the Fenry was last seen. After a lengthy trip, Noelle confronts her opponent and lifts the blade to penetrate the beast, but it hears the sound of the sword and hits the elf first. Horace comes and is impressed that the girl was not rendered unconscious by a Fenry swipe. Finally he admits he was seeking for her, the elf inquires whether the guy will kill her like he did with Vanessa. Upon hearing her name, Horace scratches his chin and recalls that this elf disappeared familiar because she was the one with the dwarf blacksmith. As a result, Horace feels that Fenry's killing of the master and apprentice is a twist of fate, but Noelle works to prevent it. However, when she charges at the wolf, he leaps over her and smacks her with his pop. Horus wants to ask one last question before the elf is consumed. He wants to know if she will serve him because her tremendous skill would be wasted in Fenry's stomach. This gift is known as Graham's Sight or the Sovereign Fairy's Eyes. There are only five recognized and unique gifts in the world and this is one. Nonetheless, Horus vows to repay the blacksmith in the same way that he does with his subordinate Amazon today, for after Horus destroyed her homeland, he sees the girl to serve him. Faced with this, Noelle says she'd rather die than serve this man, so he regrets the girl's bad decision and orders the enormous wolf to kill her. However, before the final blow, Alan appears and saves his friend's life. Horus admits that he misjudged the young man's abilities, but he also believes that it was foolish for the young man to forsake his main station to get there since if something happens to the princess, it will be difficult to reach her in time. Meanwhile, Mylene had already entered Reese and Beatrice's room. However, when she approached Princess Reese's bed, it was merely a knotted mattress. The two were already prepared for the confrontation and were hiding till the Amazon arrived. Returning to Alan, he mocks the enemy's arrogance, noting that he never considered Mylene discovery. Alan was aware of how she operates and erected a barrier around Reese that eliminates invisibility. Alan has been the target of such plans so many times in his life that he is used to them. Horace thinks it hilarious that the youngster recounted his imagined prior life, and he understands that even with Mylene exposed, Beatrice cannot overcome her. The two warriors fight for the princess's life in the enchamber, but Reese tells Beatrice to halt before she goes all out against her opponent. The Amazon takes advantage of this confusion by hitting her opponent with her elbow putting her unconscious. With this, Mylene had a clean route to finish off the princess, but instead of doing so the Amazon hesitated until Beatrice saved her companion in time. Alan, who is watching the battle from a distance, notices that the two will not require assistance and notifies Horus that his execution attempt was unsuccessful. Still, Horus believes he has control of the situation because Fenry cannot be harmed without a sacred sword. As a result, he commands the wolf to slaughter the arrogant boy and the beast's intimidating presence causes Noelle to relive past memories of her trauma and scream for Alan. However, our boy easily opens a hole in the monster's body, prompting Horus to run in the face of such overwhelming force. Soon Alan was carrying Noel back home, taking advantage of the fact that the elf had gone out after being cured. Reese rushes over to check on her pal. Fortunately, everyone is fine but Noel is upset when she wakes up and discovers Alan is carrying her without her permission. The next day, they determined that Mylene has been released from Horus's subjugation spell and should be able to communicate freely. Beatrice believes it is preferable to take her to an official trial in the capital, while Reese believes the girl is not bad and prefers a more peaceful resolution. The bodyguard informs the princess that the Amazon attempted to kill her, but she says that this was not her purpose. 
Anyway, Reese believes Mylene has someone from her people waiting for her, but the Amazon explains that her nation has been torched, leaving her with nothing, no one and nowhere to go. Noelle recalls being rescued by Vanessa at this point, and after asking her name, the dwarf blacksmith offers to take the elf to her home. Soon, in a moment of empathy, the elf blacksmith breaks the Amazon's ties and frees her, asking the girl to reside in her home. Beatrice claims that this woman could assault Reese at any time, but Noelle believes differently and if that happens Mylene will be severely chastised. With that Amazon is moved by the support she has received from this stranger and begins to cry. Beatrice believes she was too harsh on the girl, but she's actually crying tears of pleasure. As a result, Alan recognizes that the current problem has been solved. Then, in the middle of the night, he returns alone to the woodland and performs a tremendous spell. Meanwhile, Horace is far from certain that he avoided death. Still, he wonders who the youngster with such great talent is. Speaking of him, Alan had cast a spell at the exact coordinates where the elderly man was, the magic impacts the man causing a rift along the route. Following them, a terrifying entity approaches the man calmly. Alan enters at that point to ask some questions, but it appears that someone arrived first. The creature then returns to the Count of Westfeld, informing him that he killed Horace to keep the knowledge from leaking. According to the Duke, this was the bare minimum that could be done because the demons are solely responsible. His son goes on to tell that the devils put up such a show to avoid murdering the saint or the elf, in the end it appears they are not as good as they promise. The demon announces himself and declares that he will deal with the princess and elf. The guy declares that he would care for the archbishop's hero, but his son requests to stay with the archbishop. After all, he is not a failure like his brother and is capable of handling this situation. The story continues, we see Princess Reese is traveling with her uncle and the royal entourage when suddenly they are attacked by ugly flying monsters. The guards with tin bucket helmets are no match for the powerful monsters. Reese's uncle asks her to stay in the carriage while he rushes out to help fight off these monsters. Reese looks around to find numerous monsters snacking on her bodyguards when one of the monsters decides to say hi to her and breaks the glass, sending her flying below the seat, with no way to protect herself, she can only scream. The monster peeps inside to see what the fuss is all about when it screams in pain as the uncle stabs it in the back, but the monster refuses to go down without a fight and turns to rip the uncle's abdomen, spilling his guts out. He looks one last time at his knees before he's taken by the monster, who tries to eat him alive, but his thick metal armor prevents the monster's sharp teeth from piercing it. The uncle uses his remaining strength to stab the monster one more time, resulting in both falling into the river at the bottom of a steep cliff, Reese freezes in fear and stays like that. At present, Alan, Reese, and Beatrice walk into a peaceful village. The villagers are busy preparing for the returning spirits festival, in which they welcome the spirits of their departed ancestors. Despite being the most armored and huge in size, Beatrice is the only one who clutches her sword tight and scared. Another villager joins in and explains there is nothing to worry about as all they do is dress up as ghosts and dance, Beatrice lets out a chuckle trying to cover up her embarrassment. Just then, Reese asks the villagers if they know someone who wears silver armor, as she had heard a description of someone like that in the village. The villagers look confused and apologized as they don't know any such person. Reese is disappointed, unable to find her mystery man and Beatrice wonders if such a man's existence is just a rumor. Alan remembers that during their search they were still at Noelle's house, the Adventure Guild also didn't have any information. Noelle remembers hearing from a regular client of hers, who was also an adventurer about a ghost that appears in a certain village supposedly from the royal family. Suddenly, Noelle's demeanor changes and she talks about a ghost bearing a grudge born of the royal family's oppression. He wears silver armor splattered with blood and walks through the graveyard night after night. Beatrice is annoyed at this preposterous explanation when a loud thud rumbles the entire place. Beatrice is the first to jump and scream like a six-year-old girl. She soon realizes she's the only one screaming and stops to cough, but we all know she cannot redeem herself from the embarrassment. While she frantically tries to explain that she's not scared, Reese contemplates for some time before suggesting they should go to this village and investigate. Everybody looks surprised and Alan states that they cannot disregard the possibility that the royal family might know how to raise the dead. Because of this, they are currently visiting this village. Alan reminds them that Noel had mentioned a graveyard and suggests they check out the cemetery. The three venture into the spooky-looking cemetery. It is getting dark and Beatrice is not taking any chance so she draws out her sword. They hear rustling of the bushes from behind startling them, they turn to find a man with no irises standing in a daze. 
they immediately recognize him as the man they had talked to earlier. The man brings them to the village headman's house so they can ask him some questions. Alan asks what he was doing at the cemetery, the man replies that he was passing by when he saw them there so he decided to stop by, he talks in an animated way and soon takes his leave. The trio sits down with the village headman, who tells them they haven't heard any rumors of a ghost with silver armor. He offers them his house to stay for the night, as the next day is the festival. That night, Reese dreams of her uncle, who was a father figure to her and would often call him father. She remembers how he had told her that in every situation believing in people is the most important thing, as that belief becomes a connection that links them together. Reese wakes up with an epiphany and walks to the window where she sees a knight in silver armor. She calls out to him, thinking he is her uncle and follows him to the graveyard, where suddenly it becomes a scene from Walking Dead as the bodies crawl out of their graves and ominously proceeds toward Reese. Reese does what she does the best, she screams. She's suddenly woken up by Alan, who came to check on her after he heard her screaming, it seemed like she was having a nightmare realizing it was all a dream, she hugs Alan. The next morning, people gather before sunrise dressed in all sorts of Halloween costumes and dance around a huge bonfire. Meanwhile, the trio keeps their distance baffled by how the villagers are celebrating the dead, which would otherwise be considered a taboo in their kingdom. Alan mockingly states that as a knight of the realm, why doesn't she put a stop to it? Beatrice is quick to report that since it isn't causing problems for anyone it is fine. Alan notices Reese looking stressed but doesn't say anything. Just then, the man from before approaches them and encourages them to dance to. Reese politely declines, saying she would like to rest, but encourages Alan and Beatrice to enjoy. Alan uses his ultra x-ray magic eyes to see for any lurking danger. After making sure it is safe, he runs to join and Beatrice follows. Meanwhile, Reese stays there, but soon gets a whiff of something and someone calls her name. She turns to see a knight in silver armor walking away amidst the villagers dressed as ghosts. She immediately rushes, passing through the crowd into the jungle. She gets the smell again and looks up to find her uncle standing in the distance. The smell is emanating from him, which happens if you don't take a shower for days. He says that coming after him like this on her own is dangerous. She calls him father and he reminds her he's her uncle. She tells him after he went missing a search operation was put into action, but he couldn't be found. She asks what he has been doing all this while. He admits he has been resenting the royal family. He heard from the royal family so he could take revenge because Reese's father was trying to get rid of her. He elaborates that the king is targeting the lives of those who possess inborn gifts. They include the people who possess the power to vanquish the dragon, the power to create unparalleled weapons, the power to double the strength of the soldiers and bring glory to the nation, the power to read any gift. And finally, Reese's powers as a saint since these powers individually have the potential to destroy the kingdom. Reese's father thinks that these people with powers known as the puppets of gods are said to wreak havoc at the behest of the gods. Uncle extends his hand and says he wants to save Reese and asks her to join him in defeating his brother. Reese, however, refuses and says that she believes that if they can talk, they can come to an understanding and repeats what he had told her once about believing in others. Suddenly, Uncle starts levitating and smiling menacingly, he declares that her corpse won't go to waste. With that, he unsheathes his sword and strikes her but his attack is thwarted by Alan, who arrives right on time to block the attack. Uncle recognizes Alan Reese's good for nothing ex fiance Alan demands that he return Uncle Alfred to them. Alan uses Parallel Paradox spell Break on the Uncle, suddenly the spell strings controlling Uncle Break and Uncle comes back to his senses. However, he asks them to stay away and declares he is already dead. He repents saying all those things to Reese and regrets attacking her, even if it was not at his own will, he clarifies that it is not the king but the demon. However, his grudge against the bloodline is real because since his childhood sycophants and jealous people have tried to bring a rift between the two brothers. He hated the fetters that came with being a royal, which made him abandon his position and start again from scratch. That's how he became vice captain of the Premier Knight Squadron. He admits Reese was the only one who bought him happiness. He turns to Alan and asks him to take care of Reese for him. He adds that she is a good girl but also reckless. Alan admits that was his plan all along. Satisfied, he asks Alan to spar with him one last time. Alan gladly agrees against Reese's protests. Alan stops Reese and explains that Uncle is entrusting him with Reese, so he wants to make sure he's worthy of keeping his promise. Uncle praises Alan for his intelligence and warns him that at that moment he is not a corpse, but a man a knight and a father. 
They start fighting and show exceptional skills, mid-fight uncle reminds Alan that it is the returning spirits festival when living and the dead mingle, a dream of a single night, a chance to dance with those who shall never return. The two men are at par and as they continue to fight, Reese remembers another memory with her uncle. She is asked if he's really strong and if he'll protect her from scary monsters. Her uncle had promised to protect her until someone stronger than him appeared. She cries and it soon starts raining, as if the clouds are crying with her, it is time for uncle to go. By the way he's lying on the ground, it appears he lost the match. He apologizes for upsetting Reese but admits he is feeling at ease now that he knows she will be protected. He also admits feeling joy every time she calls her father. He would try putting on a brave face every time she did that, but he knows how difficult it was not to show how happy he was. Reese holds his hand and says she loves him, calling him father one last time. With a weak voice, uncle asks Reese to find happiness and then he passes away again, Reese cries bitterly. They both return to the village and it soon stops raining. Alan stands deep in thought when the village headman joins him and asks when he noticed. Alan, matter-of-factly states that he has known since the beginning that people in the village are dead and that he is controlling them. The headman asks why Alan didn't interfere. Alan admits that the dead may live amongst the living in the village but the place is peaceful. The headman reveals he is also a demon, but Alan isn't bothered and states that assuming every demon is evil just because they are demons is just naivety. Just then zombies once again make an entry from the ground and walk towards him, and Alan realizes whatever he said might not apply to them after all. The headman wants Alan as his pawn and thus sends corpses to overpower him. Alan uses his magic to break the bonds and neutralize the demon's control over the undead. Alan isn't done yet and unsheaths his blade. He uses World End 2 with one stroke move and slices the demon and the corpses into half, finally providing them a way to pass on. The demon leaves a crystal behind which Alan keeps. Meanwhile, at the Duke Palace, the Craig and Brett are not happy that their pawn, the demons failed, even after lending him their help. Craig reminds Brett that letting a girl's escape wouldn't hinder their plan, they already have the Archbishop's head in their hands. Reese, Alan and Beatrice start on another journey, and Beatrice promises that as a knight she will always be by her side. This makes Reese happy and she thanks her for being so supportive. Alan looks at the crystal he collected and realizes it is Brett. He also realizes that the uncle had his head placed on the general's body who had lost his head. Suddenly Reese has high-tech hologram producing makeup box gloves. She opens it to find a message stating General Cyril has returned shocking everybody. The story continues, we see Brett remembers the day he lost his mom and his father lost the light in his eyes. His father looked back at him without any friendly emotion and Brett was terrified of him. He approached his father one day trying to show him a pretty rock, but his father's response was so cold that Brett couldn't help but feel bad. His father called him a failure and he was surprised by his father's outburst. He overheard the maids making fun of him, so he decided to run over to his safe spot to let out his feelings. His brother came over to try and offer him solace, but he rejected it. During their later years, he thought his brother was making fun of him just like his father did. His father called him a failure of a son, but he realized that he wasn't a failure. He suddenly wakes up, but he's infuriated that his dream reminded him of his brutal past. He gets off his bed and he proceeds to the throne room to greet his father, but his father just laughs at a message he just received. He tells Brett that they can now begin their revenge on the kingdom and the gods who brought them misfortune as he incinerates the kingdom. Brett realizes he's the only one worthy and capable of ruling the kingdom. The citizens of the kingdom gossip amongst themselves and Captain Edward and Clark is soldier patrolling the streets get wind of this. They realize that the rumor of General Cyril coming back to life has the citizens on edge. Clark is worried that the rumor is spreading so quickly and Captain Edward thinks it's a deliberate action meant to incite the people. Clark wonders if Captain Edward thinks the general is an imposter. Captain Edward informs him that he doesn't care if the general is an imposter or a ghost, and he reminds Clark that their squadron must stop anyone from bringing harm to the kingdom. He reminds Clark that if General Cyril was still alive, that is what he would do. He decides that they need to uphold his will as knight and his absence and Clark agrees with him as they resume their patrols. They walk into an alleyway and suddenly a hooded figure comes out of an adjacent alleyway. Clark draws his sword, wondering who's trying to attack them but the person draws back the hood and Captain Edward recognizes the Archbishop. He wonders what the Archbishop is doing in such a place without an escort and the Archbishop informs him that there's some information he has for only his ears. The Archbishop asks Captain Edward to tag along with him, and after a moment of hesitation, Captain Edward agrees. 
Clark is surprised that Captain Edward wants to go with the bishop alone, but the captain reassures him that he won't be harmed since he's not going into battle. He informs Clark that their top priority is gathering information, but Clark still doesn't want him to go with the archbishop alone. Captain Edward reassures him once again that he shouldn't worry because he'll be back in one piece. He asks Clark to look after everyone in his absence, and he follows the archbishop down the alley. Clark watches emotionally as the captain departs, and after some time the archbishop informs Captain Edward that they've arrived at their location. The captain is surprised that the archbishop took him to the training ground and he wonders why he took him to such a place. The archbishop informs him that he's performed his role, and he suddenly disappears, Captain Edward looks around but can't find anyone. Craig suddenly appears behind him and he's about to perform backstab but Captain Edward senses his presence and he draws his sword in time to defend himself. Captain Edward's commands Craig's afford to catch him unawares, but he informs him that it's impossible because of his extreme bloodlust. Craig is glad to see that Captain Edward hasn't changed but Captain Edward isn't surprised that Craig would start a sparring session without prior notice to his sparring partner. Captain Edwards realizes that he hasn't seen Craig face to face since his wife's burial, and he wonders why he suddenly wants to meet him under such suspicious conditions. Craig informs him that he's foolish because he didn't realize that the Archbishop now belongs to them. Captain Edward wonders what he means, but Craig doesn't give him time to think about it. Craig attacks him but he brings up his sword to block the attack, wondering what Craig has done to the Archbishop. Craig felt nostalgic because he remembered the number of times they've crossed swords just like this. He informs Captain Edward that unlike their previous sparring sessions, he no longer needs the sword which surprises the captain. Brett is riding on a carriage and he remembers his mother's burial that day. That day, he asked Alan why their mother was sleeping and Alan informed him that it was because she had lost her life. Brett wondered why she lost her life and Alan told him that it was because everyone eventually loses their lives. Brett was shedding tears to mourn their mother and Alan held his hand to try and comfort him, but it wasn't much solace. Alan found out that Brett couldn't sleep, but Brett asked him what a failure was. Alan wondered why he wanted to know the meaning and Brett asked him if he thought he was a failure. Alan informed him that he didn't think so and he told him not to think about people's trivial judgment about him. Brett told him he was lying but Alan told him that he wasn't lying. Brett informs him that he's a liar because their father called him a failure. Some years later, Craig commended Brett for becoming strong because he didn't expect him to be the first to become so powerful. He accepted Brett as his true son, but he turned back to Alan and told him to get lost because he was a failure. Though Brett was sad for Alan that he was addressed as a failure, he took solace and his father's approval of him. When they were teens, Brett was angry at Alan for accepting failure as his name, but Alan congratulated him because his hard work had paid off. Brett was pissed because Alan always acted like nothing was wrong, even when people said something bad about him. He decided that Alan wasn't fit to inherit the Westfeld name so he took himself as the heir. Alan was confident that Brett would do well as the heir of the family, but he advised him not to choose the wrong path. Brett comes out of his reminisce and he wonders why he was remembering past events. The demon appears to him to inform him that things are going as planned. He asks Brett how things are going on his side, and Brett tells him that he was able to lure Edward into his trap using the Archbishop as a pawn. The demon was pissed that Captain Edward had the gift to nullify other gifts within a one meter radius, which made him practically invincible on the battlefield. The demon was sure that he would interfere with their plan, which would be troublesome but Brett assures him that Craig will handle Captain Edward. Brett informs the demon that he can put their plan into motion with his special ability without worrying about Edward's ability. Brett wondered if things would work out on the demon's end because all his previous attempts had failed. Another demon appears to inform the demon that the hero has appeared. The demons decide to go with the Premier Knight Squadron while they lend Brett some of their strength so he doesn't screw up. Brett promises there will be no mistake on his end this time because he's no longer a failure. Akira tells Sarah to stick close to her so she doesn't get lost in the crowd and Sarah decides to hang on tight to her. Akira tells Sarah she would never leave her behind, so she holds onto her hand so she feels safe. She promises to take Sarah to a place where she can stay in peace once things settle down. Akira leads Sarah through the crowd without noticing a demon stalking them through the crowd. She goes to a secluded place and asks the demons how long they plan to keep playing hide and seek. The demons finally manifest and Akira lets them know that their bloodlust gave them away. The demons are glad because it makes it easier for them to take her out, but she's confident that they can't take her down. The demons admit that they wouldn't have been able to take her down if only she was alone. Akira wonders if they will attack a little girl but the demon informs her that she's getting the wrong idea. 
The demon activates the magic sigil on Sarah, and he informs Akira that everyone from that village has a sigil just like Sarah. He wonders if she'll stand by the child while she explodes or if she'll run for her life after he informs her that Sarah will explode if he hits Sarah with a fireball. The demons wonder what the hero will do as Sarah pushes her away, hoping she runs away. Akira refuses to run away because a hero should never run away and the demons release their fireball spell. The knights notice that Clark is looking pale and he informs them that he's worried about Edward. The knights reassure him that Edward will be fine but a demon suddenly appears. Clark tells the knights not to attack because he knows they can't win against the demon and he wonders what he should do in such a dire situation. The demon admits that he doesn't bear any animosity toward them and decides to tell them the truth of the world. Meanwhile, the Archbishop and General Cyril stand on a balcony to deliver a speech to the people. Brett is controlling the general behind the scenes as he tells the people he's about to reveal the truth of the world to them. The Archbishop informs them that they were lied to because their gifts are not blessings that should be celebrated. The Archbishop informs them that they are slaves of the gods because their gifts were imposed on them instead of them to be given the freedom of choice. He is pissed that the gods control them like puppets, but he informs them that the only way they can free themselves is to give up their gifts. The Archbishop tells them to liberate themselves by doing away with the gods, but the people are hesitant because of the abilities their gifts grant them. General Cyril invites Brett to the balcony to clear any doubt that people have and he walks out on the balcony. He points out a sorcerer's dragon that will be a huge asset to them. General Cyril informs the people that the life form has the strength of 1,000 soldiers with no weaknesses and the people believe him because they tested its abilities. The people wonder if the single life form will be able to make up for their abilities and Brett informs them that his marionette power will make up for that. The Archbishop explains that the marionette draws out latent abilities that will make the people stronger than ever. The Archbishop also tells them that the gifts the marionette draws out will be gifts they're already familiar with, which they will use to assure themselves into a new age. The people slowly see the benefits of Brett's power, and they wonder what will happen when Brett passes on. Brett informs them that though they can't use gifts anymore, there will be more assets they can trust. The people wonder what he's talking about until a demon suddenly appears and takes off its hood to reveal its appearance. The people are surprised to see a demon and Brett admits their surprise is justified, but he assures them that they formed a cooperative relationship with the demons. The Archbishop informs them that they are only able to learn the truth thanks to the demons. He promises that the demons will lend them the abilities they can use to replace their gusts, and Brett encourages them to join hands with the demons so they can live as they wish. The people cheer for Brett and he takes in every ounce of their praises. Meanwhile, Edward is still engaged with Craig who manages to hurt him with his sword. Craig wonders why Edward hasn't given up when it has been clear for a while that he'll lose the fight. Edward figures out that he can't defeat Craig because he has a high level, and Craig informs him that levels are more important than skills because an increase in level leads to an increase in spirit. This leads to the creation of a superior being powerful enough to take down gods. Clark learns the truth, but he tells the demon they're knights and they'll stop anyone that wants to bring harm to their kingdom. The demon suddenly becomes invincible, takes down some knights and hurts Clark. He reappears, but Clark is still defiant and hell-bent on defending his nation, which surprises the demons. The demon concludes that he's a fool and Beatrice walks in on them, telling the demon they have to be foolish to become knights and protect their country blindly. Craig takes down Edward and he tries to get back up, but Edward warns him to stay down. The demon comes in and Craig wonders if he's taken down the demon. Akira removes the demon disguise and Craig wonders how she's still alive. She recalls how she was saved because Alan undid Sarah's sigil, and she wonders how much Alan knows about what's going on. Meanwhile, Brett is taking in the people's praises when Alan suddenly calls out to him and Brett wonders what the failure is doing in front of him. The story continues, we see Alan watches through his magic device as Beatrice confronts the demon who tried to take down Clark. Beatrice figured out that the monsters sent to take down Edward and the attempted takedowns of Reese were the works of the demons. She is disappointed that the House of Westfelt was working with the demons to orchestrate their plans and the demon was surprised that she figured it out. She wonders what the demon's plan is, and he decides to share it with her since he'll be sending her to the underworld anyway. Mylene secretly appears to record the demon and broadcast it to the citizens as the demon shares his plans. He tells Beatrice that they plan to take down the general and the princess because they would get in the way of the plans. Brett tells Alan to stop the broadcast, but the broadcast continues as the demon continues to unravel his plans. He informs Beatrice that they plan to incite humans into giving up their gifts of their own free will. Brett is pissed that Alan always does things to piss him off and he tells him to stop interfering with their scheme. 
The people now realize the true intentions of Brett and the demons. Princess Reese walks up to Alan, telling Brett to call off his plans. The people wonder if the princess was really threatened and she confirms that they really threatened to take her life. She informs the people that it was sorceress life forms just like the one Brett said would protect them. The people are now convinced that Brett didn't mean well to them and they wonder why he would connive with demons to pull off such a thing. Brett is pissed off, but he suddenly starts laughing manically at the results of Brett's meddling. He uses his marionette skill to control the knights and they involuntarily draw their swords against the people but Alan nullifies it. This releases the Archbishop General Cyril and the knights from Brett's control. Brett decides to use the sorcerer's life forms to ensure that Alan doesn't ruin his plans completely. The people notice the life forms going wild and they all run for shelter as Alan blames himself for not looking after Brett properly when they were kids. Despite feeling guilty about how Brett turned out, Alan knew it was his fate to put an end to his plans. Brett tries to use his marionette skill on Alan, but Alan definitely catches his threads which he uses to pull Brett towards him and send him flying with a heavy punch. Brett falls on his face, looking defeated and Alan stands over him looking down with resolve. Reese sees a child crying for help so she calms her down but Alan walks up to her and tells her he will be leaving the rest to her. He notices the look of worry on her face and he assures her that she doesn't need to worry because he's going to take down his father. Reese wonders if Alan won't feel bad about taking down his father which makes him remember when his father called him a failure for bringing shame to their family name. Though Alan had made peace with the fact that he was a failure, he was glad that he had people around him whom he could rely on. Beatrice was locked in battle with the demon, with Mylene helping her to remain invisible as Clark watches. The demon realizes that Mylene was the person Horace raised from infancy and Beatrice informs him that she's their ally now. The demon realizes that Beatrice is a formidable opponent so he decides to retreat but Mylene doesn't give him a chance to escape. The demon starts to open a portal, but Mylene throws her knife which lodges itself into the demon's shoulder, stopping the portal from opening. Beatrice follows up with an attack of her own, taking the demon down permanently. She wonders if Clark and the soldiers are unharmed and Clark thanks her for coming to his rescue. Though Beatrice hasn't seen Clark for a while, she realizes that they don't have time to reminisce because the demons are on a rampage. She asks everyone who can still move to lend her their strength and Clark tells her that they must use their strength to protect the kingdom and its people. Noel arrives with every weapon imaginable, so they're well equipped for battle and Clark is surprised that their plan is well thought out. He thanks her for providing them with weapons, but Noel is exhausted because Alan worked her to the bone. Meanwhile, Akira and Edward are still facing Craig, but Akira is slowly realizing that they're in a pickle because Craig's movements were abnormal, she was surprised that he was able to predict what they were going to do next and Edward informs her that Craig has the Undertaker gift which allows him to see the future. He tells her the power can't be used in battle because it demands a lot of concentration, and he wonders why Craig craves hours so badly. He tells him that Mariel wouldn't have wanted this, but Craig informs him that he keeps foreseeing her demise again and again. When he tried to avoid that future, there were some things he was able to change, but he was never able to change her demise, which pissed him off. He was disappointed that he was so powerless, which made him lose hope, but he was angry that Mariel's life was a plaything for the gods. He was pissed that her gift consigned her to giving birth to a hero, but the hero she gave birth to turned out to be a failure. Craig wished that gifts, the gods, and everything just disappeared, since Mariel lost her life for nothing. Akira tells him to let go of the past because he was too emotional to get over the loss of someone dear to him. Craig realizes that he has been dwelling on unimportant things so he decides to exchange his life force to get more power. Akira shoots lightning from her sword, but Craig counters with his magic and Akira can see that they're evenly matched. Craig increases his magic output to overpower Akira and throw her to the wall. Edward realizes that Craig's power is coming from demons, and he advises him to stop before he gets too corrupted and loses his mind. Craig doesn't care about that as he uses his dark magic to engulf Edward who starts to lose consciousness. He sees Craig's emotions of pain, grief and sorry, which makes him apologize to Craig because he had to go through such a predicament alone. Craig's dark aura disappears when Edward thinks he has regained his senses but his abdomen is greeted by Craig's steel and he falls to the ground. Craig knows that no one can understand the emotions in his heart but Akira is pissed because Edward was only trying to help him. Craig doesn't care about that too, and he decides to use his magic to take down Akira who accepts get there, but Alan comes to her rescue. Craig is amused that it's Alan of all people who chose to interfere in his battle because he's a failure in his eyes. Alan tells him he would rather have things another way if he had a choice which makes Craig point him to the door, telling him he can just leave. 
Alan resolves to stand his ground, which pisses off Craig. Craig tries to use his magic to bring Alan to his knees, but Alan cuts through it, rendering it useless. Craig is surprised because he knows his hate isn't so feeble that it can be cut with an ordinary sword which makes him wonder who Alan is. Alan reminds him that he called him a failure and Craig is surprised that Alan understands he's a failure, though accepting he's a failure. Alan informs him that there are some people he can't and that Mariel wouldn't have wanted him to do what he's doing. Craig is pissed off that Alan dares to utter Mariel's name from his mouth. Craig accumulates his magic and releases a black beam towards Alan but Alan blocks it with his sword. Alan is engulfed in his emotions and he realizes that it feels like he's in a bottomless ice pit filled with despair. He also has a glimpse into his memories, showing when he wedded Mariel and Alan is surprised that Craig showered her with so much love when she was alive. Alan realized he did his best not to see it because he looked away and avoided getting involved. Alan is about to give up once again, but he remembers that there are still people who depend on him and believe in him so he uses his last strength to push to the surface. He uses the magic from his sword to break out of Craig's spell and then attacks him with the magic. Craig is hurt by Alan's attack and he tries to gather more energy to attack him but he overloads on the demon energy and he begins to release the energy violently. The energy creates a dark energy cloud which begins growing which makes the citizens go into a panic as the cloud covers most of the town. Pandemonium almost breaks out. But Princess Reese calms the citizens down by reassuring them that Alan would take care of the source of the energy cloud. Akira realizes that the energy coming from Craig is beyond any human's capabilities which make Alan realize he has to stop Craig somehow. He uses his ultimate sword ability and he rushes towards Craig hoping to take him down with one strike. He pierces the black energy radiating from Craig, but his sword doesn't penetrate. He keeps putting in more effort trying to thrust it in with the dark energy from the energy starts to flow towards him. He's sent to Craig's mental plane where he sees Craig is a prisoner to his own rage and he's sad that Craig has lived his life like this for so long. Alan realizes that this happened because of his weakness, which made him run from the pain of being betrayed. He figures out that it's the same thing as being trapped by rage and he thanks his father for giving him the knowledge to overcome his fate. He uses his sword to cut through Craig's trapped form which frees him from bondage, the dark energy pieces and Craig returns to his old self for a little bit. A butterfly decides to use him as a landing spot which makes him start crumbling into dust. He realizes that Alan was able to fulfill his destiny despite being called a failure all his life. He looks to the heavens and calls out the name of the love of his life, as he realizes that he'll soon be joining her in the afterlife. He crumbles fully into dust, which drifts into the skies as Alan watches in awe. Alan appears before the king, who thanks him for rendering them a great service. In recognition of his efforts, the king decides to bestow upon him the title of Duke of Westfeld. While everyone is happy that Alan is appointed as the Duke, he declines the king's offer, to their surprise, wondering why we would pass on a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The advisor wonders if the king made the right decision and the king informs him that he expected Alan's response because of the things he's heard about him. The princess runs up to the king and she informs him that she spoke with Alan at length. She wonders if the king would like to hear about their conversations and he tells her to fill him in on it. The king was grateful that Alan was able to single-handedly protect both the kingdom and his most precious treasure. The king was glad that he decided to bestow the greatest honor he could on Alan because his efforts were worth it. Noelle was surprised that Alan was tagging along with them to Granholm but Alan told her he likes the place because it's very convenient. Princess Reese suddenly comes running glad that she was able to catch them before they left. They're surprised when she informs them that she would like to come with them because she wants to better her domain. She informs them that her new name is now Reese Westfelt and Mylene figures out that she's now the one in charge of Westfelt. Alan realizes that there's nothing to be done since everything has been decided and Reese tells him he just has to go with it. Noelle suddenly notices that Beatrice is missing and Reese informs her that she's no longer in her service because she's no longer in that family. Reese was originally a guard to the immediate royal family so she now had to do everything she could to get some work. Alan wonders if she'll be alright and Reese assures him that she will be fine because he's capable. Meanwhile, Beatrice screams desperately for Reese, hoping to get back into her service. Alan realizes that Reese is alone and she informs him that she feels safer with him beside her. Alan is gladdened by this and he realizes that there are still people in the world who need him. Though he had been called a failure and he felt like he was no one important. Noelle notices that Alan is lost in thought and she informs him that they're leaving, which brings him back to the present and he hops into the carriage. They all depart in the carriage with their reward from the king happy that he gave them so much to set them for life. Henriette was disappointed that the first time she took a peek at someone, he was not in a good state. 
She wondered why he bothered to reincarnate if he was just going to waste his life, but she concludes that he just can't help it. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.